Well, good afternoon, everybody. On my behalf, we have two presenters today, two brief inputs by our guests for you to listen to, and then uh, we'll have a discussion. Now, Ben, as our guest, uh, can you just introduce yourself and perhaps give a few ideas, a few points on your content so that we have an idea, uh, your agenda, and we have it from uh, with your own words? Of course. Great. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Always happy to join you here at your AX meetups not just as a participant, but also as a presenter. I'm Ben Rund from the Stuttgart area. Actually, I could speak uh, English and then some proper German will come out of the translation. So today I'll be talking about data, data in the context of products, but also in relation to location information, customer information, asset information, and how you can place a product in the right place the right time and of course you want a balanced approach you know what is complicated what takes time and what's easier and how can you bring both together so to have some input for our discussion I brought this as content and Riversand it's a Syndigo company uh, that's uh, whom I represent very happy to do so um, I can answer your questions on Syndigo and of course there's more information in writing Robert just a brief few brief words on your content what can we look forward to? Right, we also look at successful uh, clients, successful customers, and what um, differentiates them from others. And one of the issues that's very important is how can I create longer text? How can I retrieve more data? How can I better use my data? A very, very easy example how you can create more success, make more of your text without having more data, perhaps longer text also, and it's a whole new perspective. Like, I don't know enough about my product. This is very difficult when it comes to automation. So, Ben Rund. So, I'm in the partner business. I am Vice President for Business Development and Alliances, and that's why I have the pleasure to discuss a number of projects with partners and uh, customers. So, I've brought a few examples for you for today's dialogue because that way you know where we are, you know, who we are, where you can place us. We work with a number of customers in retail, global, regional customers all over Europe, mainly Germany, but also Northern America, brand CGT companies, but also many in the industrial field, technical distribution or uh, industrial manufacturing, oil and gas, pharma. So you can find us in almost any industry in small and large organizations. So automation with data is, of course, becoming more important. So what are we doing with our customers? So first of all, ingest, ingest data. As you can see here at the top, be it from the supplier or the other preliminary systems in the and the organization, be it is a data pool, Excel sheets, wherever the data come from. But um, it takes management of the data and to optimize them, to enhance them. So also to know which data is available to which customer and where, but also to publish data where they're relevant. Syndicate, that's the keyword here. Bring data into your online shop on Amazon and other online platforms to create engagement, engage. So this really smashing customer appearance. But also get feedback and collect feedback from these channels. So what's the performance of my data, my products, in comparison to my competitors? That way you'll get some feedback how to optimize your content, to um, optimize your KPIs the key performance indicators. So that's basically the growth loop from ingesting to optimizing. So what is that? Let me give you a few examples. So we're looking at uh, the content of conversion of better experience. So we work together with market researchers and we carry out studies and we found out that customers who get enhanced content like product tours this is a jeans jacket by Levi's, using a hotspot so you can enlarge uh, individual details. So 
that adds to a that leads to a 74 percent add to cart rate that's a lift for shoppers in comparison to others so gives you better e-commerce results so look, let's look at the watch ah, we used to talk about watches it's quite funny so i show um a product in occasion-based uses, so when do you use them? For example, the tide data when you're surfing, the surf activity, the mode. Am I a runner, a surfer, or a cyclist? So this gives you um, the occasion-based use. Another example, looking at these um, sports clothes, I need um, data to compare. And if I have these data, the uh, add to cart rate is nine times higher. It's quite impressive. There's a lot of them. So I just um, zoom out of the website. You know, this is quite confusing. You can't see very much. The product landing page is very long. That's enhanced content. And the impact is that a customer will click on buy. Zooming in will give you examples on the textual contextual hotspots. The Levi's jacket now there's a coffee machine. So this is the information that will be shown once you click onto the product site. Then the core content, very long description, good marketing texts. This is what we what we'll be discussing today. GDSN data pool and core content. That's uh, the form that combines a number of formats. Then there's the so-called inline enhanced content, cross sell, up sell uh, options or compare, comparison with other articles, or you can get the brand, a market-based platform. I can give you my own brand content, what I can transport as a marketer, and you know, I have the control. I'm in control. So this will usually lead to very good content. If you want to do some reading, what we're doing with IKEA, there's a blog, it's a great blog I've written. Could be interesting for you to read, but why am I showing you this? thinking of IKEA products, let's not think of Billy or other shelves, let's think of a simple pillow. So what data do you need to sell a pillow? Surely this can't be complicated. It's a very simple, straightforward product. I picked um, a pillow and I found it as 27 different attributes. I'll talk about a pillow. One single pillow. You can read it afterwards if you're interested what sort of attributes there are. So there's something behind it. It's like not just a pillow. <laughs> there's plenty of data behind it. Or let's think of a simple um, cup, a paper cup. Let's say I'm a paper, uh, pulp and paper producer, manufacturer, and I'm selling to McDonald's or other Starbucks. Isn't that, is that really complicated? Do I need a platform? Well. I took a look into a customer news case. It takes more than just a cup. You need other uh, extras like uh, a cover in different sizes. So I have, again, a number of attributes that go with this product. I have article numbers. Where do they come from? The description, the product type, the size, color, material, manufacturing unit, the packet, packaging packaging quantity there's a number of things to know and of course relationships parent and child different colors different sizes alternative products or this cover will match this cup or which um, handle will fit which cup but let's say i have a kid so i can buy bundles or collections so even with a very simple product, um, you can find that it's very complex. As obviously you don't just buy one cup, you can buy a number of paper products to international customers. And of course, this makes things more complex. Well, you know that I've always been a great fan of what AX does and hyper automation in e-commerce it's omnipresent. It's everywhere. So anything that you can automate, you should automate. But do it properly. And I'm sure we'll be picking this up again today. I looked at a mobile phone here with a very simple list of information, a RAM, name, resolution, display size. What can I do with these basic data? <laughs> I'll see later what Robert says. Well, I can generate text. Of course, 
but this doesn't tell you very much. The more product data I have, a rich, rich master data, think back to the pillow, I can produce more and more attractive text, a description of the product. And this is my very message today that I would like to add to the debate. Or let's continue here. It's not just about data, it's about value. You know, we want to present our customers with a value. Well, unfortunately, winter's coming, but um, I love barbecuing in summer. But when I buy a barbecue a grill, what's my criteria? The size? What else is there? Or for me as a customer, it might be more important that this barbecue can uh, this and that number of steaks or sausages thinking of the number of people in my family or amongst my friends. So this is an attribute. It's important when you're selling a customer value, be it a barbecue or anything else. So much from me. Robert, let's continue with you. A slightly different uh, topic here. So we have to prepare the data. We have to do the data build up. But at the same time, I have to sell my, uh, enhance my content as an editor. So I need more data, that's one thing, but I have to check myself uh, what I have and that I can retrieve as much as possible from the data that I have. So I hope this will be inspiring for you. So how can you get somewhere without necessarily uh, preparing more data? Well, often customers say, well, we need more data. What kind of data do we need? Which data? And then if you take a closer look, what's the demand behind that? We want to deliver more information. We want to increase the detail coverage. Let's take Ben's example, a pillow. Uh, it might be uh, striped or have another um, pattern, but this is the very first, the very first thing I have to deliver, of course, and, but that won't do. You know, I can't sell a pillow, just uh, just showing images of the said product. So describe more benefits. How many sausages, how many steaks will fit onto that barbecue? So if I don't know the, the surface size of the barbecue, then I can't do my own maths. Or let's say I want to do my... Um, bathroom or my, my living room and I want to lay a new floor. So how many floorboards do I need? I need the surface. I need the size of the, f the, the floorboards or um, um, a lined jacket. You know, well, if it's getting cold in winter, is it lined or not, etc. That's the benefit level. And better text, whatever better means. But there's a third thing as well. I need longer text. So higher text length. The CEO said, oh, we need 400 words. A CEO, sorry. A web designer uh, created a product. And if you only got these tiny snippets, the design won't work. It's not going to look good. So um, more of a technical stakeholder. Somebody who might not think of the customer as first thing, but still might have had good ideas. So what can we write about a pillow? This is some just a thought that you need to um, go through. So then let's say you create your text. It's all correct. So what else? Look at this product page. Enhanced product content is what Ben called it. So this is a product side. Of course, you can enlarge it. Uh, here we're looking at billiger.de, cheaper.de, describing an, an iPhone, Apple iPhone 7. What, how many generations does it have? Anyway, it's still sold, 230 euros. So somebody's still making money with this. There's still a margin. But I'm sure that most of the sellers will not um, invest much time to improve the product side. So in a long time, you can still um, make a lot of profit. Now, looking at this product page, it looks very large. But then you click into the details. Yeah, for a, a good automated product text. So the main aspects, the core message, why would you want it, the size, etc. 
128 gigabyte, it still corresponds to my existing iPhone. So this is where to place it. A good um, description still takes place. The second thing you can see visually is the highlights, the so pros and the cons, left and right, and uh, often punk, which means uh, the core message as an interim uh, title, and then uh, FAQs listed here to answer some of the questions already in the text. So the, looking at the source code, you can see these are the FAQs in JSON schema for technical search engines for SEO again. So there's a number of different uh, paragraphs on the product side. And the good thing here, the nice thing is, well, the question, why do we why does the copywriter write it? Because there's different readers different with different access to a text. Do, do I just click on it for a quick comparison? Then I'll check the highlights. Do I want to see the differences? Do I want to convince somebody to buy the product? Uh, do I need arguments so I'd look at the pros and cons? Or before buying the product, do I check whether I have overlooked something? Or I have, well, I have a product description that would work for any standard reader, um, but also for technical experts who would look into detail at the product facts. And what's so exciting here, and that's why I brought it along, looking at the technical FAQs, all four uh, paragraphs, all four segments, are based on the very same data set. So to produce the triple length and to provide four different types of text to serve four different groups of readers. Um, it was not rocket science. We do using the same data. Of course, these data need to be sound and reliable. To start with, that's clear. Looking at the amount of volume I get, the information, the attributes, that was quadrupled. I've got four times as much with the same data. So all reusing the existing data. And it's not a process that just takes one step. There's several steps in here. So first of all, there'd be a standard product description, one or two paragraphs. So no major formatting or interim titles. So you just do your job. You have 20,000 SKUs excuse, in different uh, languages. So that's that's the first thing you do. I really like the pillow example. Ben, I love it. Of course, I want to know the the pattern. You know, if it if it, if it just says uh, it's a pillow, I'm not getting anywhere. So, in the next step, I add informant uh, important information in the description, the logo of the manufactured producer. So I don't, I don't just get the standard the standard uh, information. It's getting better and better. And then in the next step, this is where you get. So this gives you a very nice product um, page. As for the landing page of iPhone 7, as, as shown, I've, I, I think we're with iPhone 13 now. So it's automated for each and every mobile phone that you might have in your range of products. But we'll uh, talk about this later in detail at some other time. I think this gives enough uh, content for another meetup. So just, just as a quick uh, look out, most of you, most of our customers are actually getting there. But we still get this question, don't I need more data? And basi basically, it's not wrong, but you can do a lot with the existing data to multiply your appearance. As an example for BIN, I brought an exercise to create a data model. <laughs> this is one of, one, of my, one of our customers. So <laughs> give this shoe an automated text. And what's the data model? Actually, it's, it's a, a Snow White a boot. And there's a whole series of it. So, so much for that. For you, these are four uh, points. That's what I promised the previous meet end. So um, start multiple content types, starting adding multiple content types. Look on the website for something um, you're already doing. 
bullet lists, for example, and use these bullet lists and integrate them into the text, ingest them. So that way you can create a longer text, a higher text content, have more SEO uh, topics to fill in websites. Most sites are created in a horizontal way, that's what they're foreseen. Then um, a text that's easy to read, easy to scan, in addition to an image, perhaps. So, Robert, so choose your perspective. You did a technical breakdown. Let's just have a very quick look. The content level separated from the usability perspective. So you spoke about people who just scan the text and those who really read through the text. Perhaps there's a similar structure with the with the end devices. Perhaps let's take a look at that. So what are the perspectives? What perspective do I need to take? Looking at usability and I can produce different contents with the same set of data. So my advice here, um, the various promises of the types of text must be reflected. FAQ must not repeat information. It really must provide an answer to, to a question, the typical question that people might have. Same goes for a pro and con box. I can repeat uh, 72 grams, that's the weight of the product, but I have to say whether that's a light product or it makes it rather heavy. As for devices, mobile devices or desktop devices, actually people think that on the mobile phones people don't read much. Actually, I can read more, people tend to read more, but they just scroll down, but here I need to carefully create sections so that people know in the title what to expect from that part of the text. Okay, so this segmentation into uh, content perspective, perhaps we can say something more specific about that. So looking at the FAQs, I'm trying to summarize here, in both cases, I'm looking at the, uh, the battery lifetime. So uh, I can say like your battery lasts 12 hours and in the FAQs perhaps you can place this or make it more tangible. Exactly, exactly. FAQ require different kinds of information as somebody who reads through all the text. So I need to find a different highlight, a different perspective for the benefit or else yeah, I can just I could just leave it rather than just repeat the technical details or leave the product detail table away. Or um, say that a printer has a, a certain resolution, mm -hmm, DPI, whether that's a lot or not a lot for a laser printer. So the, the, the judging of a product, the evaluating, the evaluating of it, uh, that makes a difference for a reader. So it really needs to be placed where the reader expects it to be and finds it, notices it. So, okay, we have the data sheet with the technical detail. That's one thing. But a number of users who are not experts say, if I want to buy a printer, then I don't necessarily look at the data sheet. A typical example when people don't send a product back is um, I have to remember, mention several times that a certain textile needs to be hand washed, you know because people send it back after washing it. Okay. Okay, I, I know how to do hand wash my, my stuff, no problem. So we can't um, discuss everything and anything. Uh, we can't name all the horses and the jockeys. But let's uh, summarize and looking at a number of interesting customers who, you, who are using the PIM by Riverset. So what are the typical questions? that you get, Ben. What are your traditional answers when introducing a PIM or a restart of a PIM? Yeah, they might have one and then they try, they, they think about including AX. So what are the questions that you get over and over again and you say, look, don't worry, or this is something you must take into account. So what do I take home from your presentation, from you as an expert? That's a good question. My answer comes from AX automation perspective. So it's a, it's a whole big issue. What's always, always important is the following. 
So when you look at this project, what's the outcome? What's the desired outcome? Make it dependent on that, on the objectives, on the outcome. It's important for PIM, of course. Uh, what category uh, does it need to hit home in? Do you want to save costs, save expenses? Do you want to generate sales turnover? Or is it operational efficiency? So it's all three major criteria that are uh, important in your organization, your um, company, looking at PIM, including AX. So looking um, at AX specifically, first of all, the question that it turns turn to us, really, um, to Riversand, when going for automation, well, I'm afraid that there's some, some bullshit comes out of it. So the first issue to discuss is data quality. This is what needs to be looked after as a first step. So of course, I have to get the correct information, the size of a product. Anything that's important, all the parameters that are important, they must be correct and precise. And I must avoid mistakes. I must, you know, typing typos, for example, need to be avoided. And of course, people are worried, usually, do I have enough quality? Do I have the internal uh, processes set up in a way that it leads to easy peasy automation and a good result? And the second point, or the second question, really, looking at the legal uh, background, is it legally OK? And perhaps uh, we can uh, we can look at this. Okay, great. But one uh, quickie question in between. You talked about the the outcome, the desired outcome. And Robert just uh, explained to us that 90% of our customers describe a customer journal. So what are the main KPIs? I need 20 things, and then that's done. And then using this text, I develop conversion optimization. And then the third step, the third stage, we're in the middle of a structured text in which we try to um, take on board different perspectives, different reader groups. And here again, we see that our customers want to enlarge, enhance their data in PIM. How dangerous, difficult, complicated is it really when I start PIM today? Does it take a lot of effort? But then I see in six months, I need five new fields. I need a certain extra information. I need to retrieve that. And then you said, no, so that's not possible because it wasn't in the desired outcome. Or what does it you do? What does it would a, a, a PIM um, consultant say, rather than you have to pay eight times as much? That's an interesting question. I guess the important thing is to know that it, it should be a problem. Normally, it's not a problem. But of course, there are products that have a fixed data model. So complex modifications will not be easy to um, implement. You might need to reprogram everything. A good platform has a flexible data model. And in theory, each field on each entity, relationship, context, could be a channel like Amazon or a country, can be adapted at any time. I use the UI for configuration. Of course, I need the, the access rights as a user. Or I use an admin. Shouldn't be a problem, really, in a flexible cloud solution, I'd say. OK. A bit of a crazy question. I really don't know, Ben. And please tell me off if I get it all wrong. But So let's <laughs> the barbecue the length and the width, and I want to have the surface in meters square. Can I use the PIM or Riversand to do that? <laughs> That's a good uh, question. The calculations. We often get this question on measurements and calculation. The oldest question comes from the price um, environment. And of course, we say that theoretically, any PIM can save a price, but also calculate uh, a price. But it's no longer state of the art. Existing engines are correctly um, suggested, etc. But the price could be stored as a reference information. You'll find that under saved information. But you asked about the size. Well, 
automated configurations or calculations of packaging units. This is mm, a default. So automatically, a six pack of uh, soaps will will fit into uh, a pallet. So this kind of data is forwarded to an online shop. So basically, yes, it's possible. The question is, does it make, make sense? And what is the result, the outcome on e-commerce for sales channel? OK, so the calculation is possible. I can calculate the length divided by 60 or 80 um, centimeters to know whether, whether a number of people are comfortable at the table. Yeah, you just have to see whether it makes sense. Of course, it makes sense in a text that you've uh, just uh, shown. Like four steaks and eight hot dogs, or I can play six people or eight people uh, at a table. That is an interesting information. So the question on legal matters, can you perhaps say a few words on that? What is it that, you, um, that made you mention this today? Well, personally, let me say that I didn't think it was a big issue. I do my data work, I have the attributes, I ingest them, I optimize them, and I, it gives me a beautiful text, so what could be possibly be wrong with that? But this is a lesson learned. Customers ask themselves, what about copyright? Will this create copyright problems? Um, are we duplicating things, problems uh, in copyright to be expected? Of course, GDPR is an issue here. Data protection, especially if I take out bits and pieces of a text or I produce individual text segments, customers are not really reassured. They would consult their legal counsel when creating text, and then the whole thing is getting very complex. And if a problem is made where there is none, so I think um, here customers need to perhaps uh, make a close read. Of the uh, of the existing uh, legal text, yeah, the GDPR. That's true. Um, that needs some clarification. Robert, I forward a question that I found in chat. Very pragmatic question. On practice in right diff styles container. How can they be um, implemented? How can they be created? Like in your example of Liga DE, we'll forward this to customer success, but. Perhaps we, uh, uh, we we treat this anonymously. I won't name the name. Okay. Ask support. That's a good idea. They can share examples. But Billiger DE in this case, and that's important, is when looking at styles and container. They don't necessarily manage and produce our tools, but the best place really is the pro and con box, for example, using markers and then when importing the data, modify it into HTML or in what kind of form presentation. So we'll have a box and the next title will be a box that will be green and then the next title will be followed by the box that's uh, gray. So just make sure that design and content is separated. So the, the ROM, the hash key is usually what we recommend, three hash keys. But make sure it's separated because next time, otherwise, uh, in your design work, you'll have to re-modify it in your text. So it's complex. So questions, please write them in the chat or use the question box in Zoom. So a question to you, Robert. The KPIs of the three tiers of the text, the three layers. So what is the driver for customers? You know, how do they measure their success in the three segments? So the first step is fairly easy. First of all, you have to solve the problem of the amount of text, the text volume, uh, the products generated without text or obsolete text, and that makes sense. That way I get protective, and then the process of producing a text, uh, 
that'll help me along. And most people want to optimize their conversion rate. And here we might notice that the first thing to be discussed is that texts must be, uh, you know, really be taken in by customers. So I might have a great text, but if for whatever reason people don't read your text, then uh, it's nothing to write home about. Looking at the content engagement rate, that's an important factor. So do people interact with the content? The engage phase, this is what Ben mentioned in his circle, and conversion, of course, and uh, scaling KPIs. Uh, using several languages, how fast can I put text online? Do I gain traffic by choosing this solution? Or do I get um, traffic sources that way that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise? The FAQs, looking at Billy Gade here again, uh, leads to um, the fact that you're Googling the product and the Google user will not leave the search page. They actually will not land with billiga.de on their page. They just get the snippets. So this is a secondary effect, of course, because um, using FAQs, the customer will no longer be brought back to billiga.de necessarily. Different reasons, mark of course, and clicks. Let's say you rank seconds. Uh, I have uh, five visitors and two of them buy my product. Now, KPIs. What would, why would you call something under successful PIM? When is PIM successful? Well, I mentioned the three categories, operational efficiency, reduce costs, or increase turnover. Now, when you're looking at the turnover figures, there's calculations. There's computing, and every organization, every company must know what their desired outcome is. So looking at the top CEOs, how can I break this down in the categories, relevant categories? So looking at e-commerce and turnover, I need conversion rate. Conversion rate is an important topic, so that will appear in any um, anywhere here. Do I have mail cross sale, auto cart trail, sale rate? Sorry, that helps when mapping content. Adding to the three tiers, the three levels that were mentioned, with the first level, it's not really sexy, you know. So to produce the first. Uh, step, the first layer, the question, is my data complete? Do I have all the indication of the size of the product? Looking at the quality dashboard or the product uh, category, I can see uh, whether, let's say, selling lamps, um, is it complete? So manual, manualized uh, approaches can work. But this is the first not very sexy step then the journey can start. Then Robert is right, the existing sound material of data can provide different versions, different variants of text. So with the first, second or third visit to an e-commerce site, you can perhaps try different versions. And then using the same uh, existing data set, I can make more. I don't need 27 attributes times three for the very same pillow, be it checked or striped, and they were on the same wavelength. Again, I thank our speakers, I thank our guests. A very interesting and lively discussion. Ben, thank you very much for your input on data and PIM and how we move towards a profit center. Heike, in the background, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.